today we're taking a little bit of a break from our Roman series. Uh, what I wanted to do is before we go into communion at the close of the service, it being Christmas Eve Sunday, I felt it would be appropriate for us to look at the Christmas story, right? So uh, that's what we're going to do. And we're going to look at Matthew chapter one. So if you have your Bible, your iPhone, your Android, your iPad, whatever it is that you use, uh, check out Matthew chapter one. That's where we're going to pick it up. Well, the title of the message is The Baby That Changes Everything, which babies have a, a, a way of doing that, don't they? You know, your life was going along easy, and then all of a sudden that baby comes, and that, that just changes things. I can remember when Debbie and I were taking David home from the hospital, and we're driving, you know, the wild and crazy streets of Springfield, Missouri, and I never drove so carefully in all my life. I mean, I was like, hey, watch out. Don't run into my precious cargo in the back there. Babies change everything. I mean, they change your priorities, they change your sleep schedule. You know, one of you is getting up with the baby, the other one's pretending like they didn't hear the baby. Come on, you know that's true. They change your travel. I mean, even like a simple trip down to Silver Dollar City, it's like you, you like need a, a big moving van to be able to, get to take the baby to Silver Dollar City. You're packing up. They, they, they change your persona. I mean, uh, I was reminded of that when we were in Arizona. We were walking through a parking lot, and I had to take this picture um, right there on the back of a minivan. I used to be cool. Is that not the truth? You know, you were cool, you were driving that cool truck, but now you are driving a minivan, and even the nicest minivan kind of puts a little dent in your uh, cool persona, right? So uh, Debbie and I had to laugh at that when we saw that. So Matthew chapter 1, we come to a, an awesome story. It's the story of the birth of Jesus in Luke's gospel. It tells it from Mary's perspective. When you are in Matthew's gospel, it's from Joseph's perspective. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus took place in this way. I don't know about you, but when I read that, just that sentence, can you imagine a more understated, simple way? I mean, just straight up, this is how it happened. I mean, this is the person who's going to change all time and eternity, all history. So without any bigger introduction than that, just very, very simple. Because you see what the gospel writers are doing. They're not trying to sell you on Jesus. They're just simply going to tell you about Jesus. And if you listen and take the story at face value, you like the Roman centurion will come to the end and say, truly this man was the Son of God. The birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. I highlighted the word birth because it's, it's interesting. It's translated as birth, but really if you go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the word genealogy is the same word that is translated as birth. Literally, you could have it read this way. Now, the genealogy of Jesus Christ took place in this way. What is Matthew doing? Well, in verses 1 through 17, what Matthew is giving us is the human genealogy of Joseph. And what we learn when we read that is we learn that if there was a king in the land of Israel at the time of Jesus, a Jewish king, it's Joseph. He has the right to the throne. Jesus gets his right to the Jewish throne through his adopted father, Joseph. But because he's not Joseph's son, he's only the adopted son in the sense of he doesn't have the bloodline of Joseph. He has the right to the throne through Joseph. His, his bloodline is what? It's divine. Consequently, you have now the genealogy of Jesus. What is the genealogy of Jesus? He is from the Holy Spirit. We're going to learn about that. So, humanly speaking, that's how he's introduced into the world. So, 
we are going to look at this story as we do. What I want to do is I'm going to give you three principles, three principles out of the Christmas story that can help us understand what God was doing on that first Christmas. The first one is this, God whispers to us. God whispers to us. It's important for everybody in this room, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, to understand that God is a God who speaks. He's speaking all the time. A lot of people say, I just wish I could hear God. Well, he's speaking, so it's not as he's speaking. The the issue is, are you listening? In fact, I use the word whisper because uh, unless we listen closely, we might not hear what God is saying. We might miss it, but God is a God who speaks. As we've seen in Romans, he speaks through natural creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. But God is a God who is constantly speaking. You read in the the Bible, if you have the New International Version, over 300 times it says, and the Lord says. So you get the idea that God is a God who speaks, and he speaks in a variety of ways. He speaks through that still small voice. He speaks through dreams. He speaks through prompting. He speaks through his word. He's a God who speaks, and he's speaking constantly. One of the things you find in the Christmas story, very, very interesting, is he's speaking. God is talking all the time. If you look in in Luke's gospel, he is speaking. He he speaks to Zechariah, this aged priest, right away in chapter 1. And then he's speaking to Elizabeth, and he's speaking to Mary, the mother of Jesus. You get into chapter 2, and he's speaking to the shepherds, and, and then he's speaking to Simeon, and then he's speaking to this godly old woman by the name of Anna. He's speaking. God is speaking all the time. And when you look in Matthew chapter 1, one of the things you learn is that, is that again, God is speaking. He's speaking to Joseph, which, which tells us something about Christmas. Christmas, the whole story reminds us that God is a God who is speaking. In fact, I, w- I would suggest to you that, uh, you know, when I talk with people, I love to talk to people right when they come to Christ. Because what happens is you can go back and ask them about their life up to that point, and invariably people will say, well, you know, I, I, felt, like, I felt like maybe God was real here, or I, I had this encounter, I had this experience. Almost always people will tell me of, of experiences that are very much at their core supernatural because God is a God who speaks. He's speaking to believers today. He's speaking to unbelievers because he's a God who speaks. And at Christmas, he not only spoke, he shouted. But you read the story and you see two verses into it. God is a God who speaks. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, that's Joseph, in a dream, saying, Joseph, God speaks. God knows your name. God has things to say. So he speaks in a dream through an angel, but then you look a couple verses later, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. So he speaks through the word of God. God is speaking all of the time in a variety of ways. He's a God who speaks. The problem is a lot of people either aren't listening or there's people who who maybe have heard God speak, but his voice has grown dim, and the reason why is they have delayed obedience to his voice. In other words, God spoke, but if if you and I don't act on what we hear, it becomes more difficult to hear clearly his voice. In fact, let me just say this, that The longer you wait to obey, there are some things that are are true of that. God speaks. If if you're not obeying, there are things that happen. Number one, the less sure we become that God has spoken. I don't know whether you've had that happen. I'm sure you have, where you, you feel prompted, like you should call this person, you should text this person, you should pray for this person, you should maybe, you know, like maybe you see somebody and you, know, you should buy that person in the restaurant the meal or, or this particular person you're interacting with, that there's a struggle that's happening and, and you just need to address it or maybe you need to invite that person to church or, or whatever it might be. 
What happens is we can find ourselves saying, well, is that really God? I wonder if that's God. I wonder if it's me. I wonder if it's just God. And the longer you do that, the less clearly you're going to hear God's voice. People say, well, but what if I'm wrong? What if you're right? What if you miss the opportunity to do something that makes an eternal difference in somebody's life? So the longer we wait to obey God when he speaks, the less sure we become that, that he's spoken. Second, the more quiet the sound of God's voice becomes. Because if I'm not going to listen to God, part of what it's acting on it that cultivates a, an ear towards God's working in my life. But if, I, if I'm waiting to obey, God's not going to tell me something new if I didn't pay attention to what he's already said to me. So when we wait, the sound of his voice becomes quieter and it becomes more difficult for us to obey. You know, waiting to obey God doesn't make it easier to obey God. The longer we rationalize, the longer we vacillate, the longer that we, we sit back and we say, well, you know, I don't know, and maybe, maybe not, or, you know, I'm just not sure. You know, the longer you wait to respond to the gospel, the harder it is to respond, I would suggest. The longer you wait to do whatever it is God is calling you to do, God is prompting you to do. And when, I, when we talk about his calling, I'm not necessarily talking about a geographical relocation. It may be something like God is speaking to your heart. You know, I want you to give up doing this. I want you to stop doing this, or I want you to start doing that. And you're sitting there, and you're rationalizing, and you're debating, and you're delaying, and it doesn't make it any easier for you to do it. Here's the thing that's so interesting about Joseph. The one characteristic that is repeated more in the Bible, though Joseph doesn't appear uh, in, in much of the Bible. He kind of comes at the beginning of Jesus' life, and then he's gone. But the thing that's repeated on four occasions about him is this is a man who listens to God. It's very, very interesting. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're the God of the universe and you're going to entrust your son in human form as a baby to parents, what kind of father are you going to want? You're going to want a father who listens to God, right? And the proof of listening is he does what God tells him to do. And you find that on four occasions in the Christmas story that whenever God speaks, Joseph is all over it. You see that here. We saw it in verse 24. You see it in chapter 2. Herod's going to come to Bethlehem, kill the babies. Joseph doesn't know that. An angel warns him in a dream. And Joseph, wh what does he do? His obedience is instant. I mean, he's like, we're up, we're out. In the middle of the night, they're gone. And you have to believe it's not any easier for them than it would be for you if you in the middle of the night were awakened by the Lord and God said, I want you to get out of town. I want you to go hundreds of miles. I don't want you to take a car. I want you to take a donkey. It's not easy. And then he's down in Egypt and, and now he has a dream and the Lord speaks to him and says, listen, leave Egypt, go back to the land because the people who were trying to kill Jesus are now dead. So he gets up and he goes back and he thinks, hey, you know what, I'm going to go and I'm, we're going to live in, in the area of Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, just kind of like a suburb, if you will, of Jerusalem. We're going to go there because after all, I'm raising the Messiah. But then he gets there and he has another dream. And this time the angel says, listen, don't go there, go up to Galilee. And it's not a place he wants to go for a variety of reasons that we're going to get into. It's not a place he really wants to be. But if God has said it and God has told him, that's where he's going to go. And you get the sense when you read the story, God speaks, he does it. This is a man who hears from God and obeys. But the Christmas story tells us God is a God who speaks. He's a God who whispers. So the second thing I want you to notice as we make our way through this, God works all around us. 
That's such an exciting thought that God is at work all around us. The problem for a lot of people, myself included, is that, that he works in ways we don't expect. Or he works in ways we can't see. Or he works in ways we don't understand. He works in ways we can't begin to figure out. That's Joseph. Let's look at it in verse 18. Now, the genealogy or the birth or the genesis is the actual Greek word. Of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed. Now, I want to I stop there for a moment because if we don't understand the betrothal process, then we miss the ramifications of what's happening in this story. And, and as you're going to see, it's absolutely significant. We have a tendency to, to transpose our culture and our understanding of human relationships, of cultural expectations. We have a tendency to bring everything into the 21st century when we're reading the Bible. And, and if you do that, you miss some things. Or we make judgments on that day, not thinking that, hey, different day, different time, different mores, everything's different. And we have to understand their world to appreciate what the writer of Scripture is teaching us. And we can't just go to our own day and say, well, it's like this because it's not. And that day, a betrothal might start years before marriage. What would happen is, you know, you would have at the time of the marriage, uh, a Jewish girl would be, the betrothal would become official when she was maybe 12, no later than 13. The, the groom would be maybe 18 years old. So he would, at 12, he becomes a man. He begins to learn his father's trade. So he's working on the trade. He's, he's becoming a man. He's developing him in his ability to do the trade, which in Joseph's case, he's a stonemason. Uh, the Greek word is tecton. So that's what he does. He lays brick. He lays rock. Uh, if you go to the land of Palestine, very little is made out of wood. So he's not building tables and chairs. He's, he's a stonemason. And um, what would happen is, long before she's 12 and long before he's 18, the parents would get together and would say, you know what, I, I think it would be great for my son to marry your daughter. It'd be an arranged marriage. Now, let me just say this, and I, and I think there is a, a, a concept that people need as believers to, uh, to consider. And especially like to say to the, to the ones in, in listening today who are at that age of getting married. I would suggest to you that though there's, there's not arranged marriages in our society, there is still the necessity to listen to parents regarding your selection of a mate. That the Bible says children Obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And it's, it, the issue is not, there's no caveat like until you're 18, until you're 21, until you're living on your own, but, but rather there is this idea that a child honors their parents and that a child understands that there is an authority that the parents have over them that comes from God and that when we recognize God's authority best and most, when we recognize the authority of those he has placed over us. So that in some sense, there's an honor of my, my parents, and yet as a parent, I understand that I want to let my children make decisions, but I don't let my children, when they are choosing a mate, make that decision in a vacuum. What, what, what a parent says is critical. So that the way it would roll for, for me, if somebody asked me to do their wedding, to perform uh, the wedding ceremony, one of my first questions is, are the parents in or out on this? You say, well, what if, what if they're like 25? I don't care. Are the parents in or out? Because it's not two people getting married, it's two families getting married. There's a connection there. And if the parents 
aren't behind it. When the stress of life begins to put pressure on that union, and there are parents saying, well, I told you from the beginning, that person's a loser. You, then what happens is the ability of the marriage to survive, the, the marriage is substantially weakened because there is not the value of parental support pushing toward the marriage. Let me say this as well, that nobody loves a child, cares about a child, or understands a child more than the parent. And oftentimes, a parent can see things both in their own child and in the people that that child is drawn to that may be good or bad, and the parent knows what will be best, what will be most workable. You say, well, what if my parents will give the blessing? What I've told people before, I've at times sat down with both families and said, let's talk this through. Sometimes we've been able to reach an agreement. Sometimes the parents say, you know what? I'm not in favor of it. And my counsel to the couple is, then I would wait. Because you want the blessing of the Lord and you want the, and if the parents are saying, I'm out, let God do a work in the parent's heart and trust the Lord to do that. That's hard for people to hear. I'm just saying over time, over my years as a pastor, I would say that has proved to be invaluable for most people. You say, I don't have a parent that I can do that with. Well, then obviously that, that's different. But the fact that they're saved or unsaved doesn't, isn't the determinative factor in whether or not you're going to seek their counsel. Honor your parents. Honor your father and mother. It doesn't say if they're godly. It doesn't say if you think they're worthy of the honor. Honor them. This is the way God has set this up. Um, I could go on, but we're not talking about marriage. Sorry. <laughs> Back to the Christmas story. So you've got this betrothal. It's, a, it's a officially a one-year period. It's uh, something that's been arranged by the parents. During this time, the, the man and the woman may not, in fact, probably do not really know one another. So they've not, they've not um, spent any time together. The rabbis taught, don't let a betrothed couple spend more than, um, and it, there was a, a period of time, it's like 20 minutes, there's a way of putting it uh, together, lest they, uh, lest they become sexually involved. So the idea that Joseph and Mary would really know, he may know who she is, she would know who he was, they might have brief opportunity for conversation that would amount to little more than greeting. But the idea that they would be left alone to get acquainted before they're married uh, would be foreign to that culture. So here they are, they are betrothed to one another. Mary's family would have brought a, a dowry, which would be a, a measure of wealth that would help the couple as they get started. Her parents would have been saving for this. In, more, in a more primitive day, earlier in Judaism, the man had paid a bride price to the parents like Joseph or like Jacob did um, with, back in Genesis. But by this time, in this day in Roman times, uh, the Greco-Roman world, there was a dowry paid by the wife. And so it would be there for them as they start their life together. This betrothal then would be a binding contract, not only between the, the couple, but between the families. So binding was it, so permanent was the betrothal that it required divorce. It was as if legally you were already married, though in fact the ceremony had not taken place. Now verse 18. Before they came together, she, that's Mary, was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to, for just a moment, you may know the story, and many of you do, but whether you do or not, I want you to back up long enough just to think this through. The realities of this are startling, they are shocking, and because we don't, we don't live in their culture, we don't think through the ramifications that are a part of this, and they are massive. Put yourself for just a moment in Joseph's sandals. A girl that 
you don't really know, but you've been told is a good girl, a godly girl, that your parents have said, this is the one for you, and you have met her, and you have observed her, but you don't really know her beyond what you've been able off um, periodic gatherings, you've been able to get a sense of who she is. In one of those brief conversation. So she and Joseph don't have like a two-hour get-together to talk this through. Society and culture will not allow it. So this girl comes to you. You're 18. She's 12 or 13 years old. She comes to you, and she says, uh, Joseph, I know we don't have a lot of time here, but I, I really need to talk to you, and I've got good news, and I've got bad news. Which do you want first? And Joseph says, well, give me the bad news first. I'm pregnant, but I haven't had sexual relations with another man. And Joseph's thinking, well, you haven't had them with me either. So, I mean, can you imagine in that moment what's going through his mind? I mean, this doesn't make sense. This is, shy. he's like, well, what's the good news? She's like, oh, well, hey, um, you know, I haven't been with another man, but an angel appeared to me. In fact, the angel Gabriel appeared to me, and when he greeted me, he said, greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And then he told me that the power of the Most High would overshadow me, and, and I would conceive and give birth to a son, and he'd be called the Son of God. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that that sat with Joseph about like it would sit with you. You would think you are certifiably nuts. And now Joseph's in a massive, massive quandary because he has to make some choices here. What's important for, for us to understand in our day is his day is different than our day, so his choice is different than our choice. A lot of people have thought, well, his choice is do I take her or do I divorce her? That's the choice. No, that's not even a choice he can make societally. His choice is not do I divorce her or do I give her a second chance. His choice is this. Do I quietly divorce her, try to, try to just not make a big deal out of it, let the dowry go, give it back, say, hey, God bless you, see you later, and do it quietly, or do I publicly do it and, and for all to hear and to know what went down, and when I do that, several things happen, not the least of which is I clear my name, and I clear my family's name which in that oriental culture is huge even today. This whole idea of saving face, this whole idea of I never dishonor my family, I never bring shame to myself. So he can publicly do that and he can say, you know what, Mary, she's pregnant and it's not my child and proof of that is I am divorcing her and I'm keeping the dowry as a punishment to her and her family and a shame to them. If he marries her, you say, well, what's wrong with marrying her? If he does that, what happens is in the society, he, there instantly are a host of, of ramifications that are massive to him and to his family. First of all, he is, his masculinity is questioned. What? He couldn't stand up to a promiscuous wife? What in the world? What kind of man is he? Second, he is called a godly man. He's called a just man. So already at age 18. He, is, he has been viewed as, as a man who loves God more than most. He's been viewed as somebody who, uh, who serves God by following the commands of the Lord, by loving God, by being faithful. But now all of a sudden, if he doesn't clear his name, now everybody's saying, you're a fraud. We all thought you were something you're not. 
Remember, this is a small town, and the word now is all over the town. So now what happens is he wasn't man enough to stand up to her. He didn't care, if you can believe this, and this is the biggest thing of all in that mindset. He didn't care enough about his family's reputation. He's dragging their reputation through the mud. Now, you can say, you know, I don't get that. I don't agree with that. It doesn't matter what you get or what you agree with in terms of your American view. You have to understand this is the Middle East. This is, this is not only the Middle East. This is the Roman world at that time. If he drags his family's name through the mud, it, it would be better off in society's eyes that he were dead. Not only that, the recovery for him would be almost impossible. And then you start thinking, okay, the whole Jewish life, the synagogue, the community life, it's not just religious, it's social. And now all of a sudden, he becomes a social outcast at age 18. Who's he going to marry? Who's he going to do business with? Who's going to hire him? Who's going to trust him? His, his influence in the synagogue is gone. I mean, this is, a, this is a catastrophic turn of events for him unless he publicly, clearly separates himself from her. This is, this is uh, he's got to defend his honor. Verse 19, look at it. And her husband Joseph, being a just man, and the, the idea, the word there is, is being a righteous man. Uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, uh, Sadiq, a, a man of standing, a man of honor, a man who loves God and, and who not only says he loves God, but his life radiates a love for God. That's Joseph. He's a good man, so all of a sudden, here he is. He's, he's loved God. He's served God. He's honored God. And, and already at age 18, this says something about Joseph and the quality of this individual that already at age 18, he has achieved a status and an honor that usually would be reserved for a person of 30 I mean, he's, be, he's an up-and-comer. He is a leader in the community. He is a man of standing, distinguished by his love for God and his knowledge of the law and his, and his living for the Lord and his kindness and all the things that would be, would be admirable and right. That's Joseph being a just man. And in that, we have a tendency to somehow equate a love for God and, and a righteousness with God and a holiness with God with somehow being harsh and vindictive. But that's not, that's not the way God is, and that's not the way people who really love him are. Because in his righteousness, there's an unwillingness to hurt Mary. Though... He does want to defend his, the honor of his family and not hurt them. So he's in this quandary. He's like, okay, what do I do with this? Because I don't, hey, forget the dowry. I don't, I, I, I give that back to her. She's going to have enough problems to deal with. She doesn't need additional financial burden. And her family is as well. They're going to need the money because she's not probably going to be able to ever marry. And she's probably going to have to be sent off somewhere. And all of that's going to be her reality. Verse 19, he says, verse 19, please. Unwilling to put her to shame, he resolved to divorce her quietly. So he's thinking, okay, I'm going to just quietly put her away. But he's trying to sort this out because there's a lot at stake. His future's at stake. His reputation's at stake. Her reputation's at stake. I mean, her reputation, for all intents and purposes, is shot. So he's in this struggle. He's in this this angst, he's feeling this incredible anxiety over this. Can you imagine? Verse 20, it says, as he considered these things. As he considered these things. 
You know, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting to me. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not. But when you read the Christmas story, before Zachariah and Elizabeth have John the Baptist, before anything happens, the angel comes and says, hey, Zachariah, guess what's going to happen? God's heard your prayers. This is what's going to go down. Before Mary gets pregnant, the angel comes to her and says, hey, here's what's going to happen. But poor old Joseph... I mean, you can picture him saying, like, you know, Tavia on the fiddler on the roof, would it be too much for you to come and tell me what's going to happen before it does? He, he's the only one in the Christmas story of the primary characters who's really kind of left out in the cold. And he's struggling and he's grappling. But what I want you to see is in the bigger picture, God is working in a massive way. Working, I want to suggest to you, not only in Mary's life, but in his life. I say it because there, there are some of you here today and you're dealing with, with a struggle with the wrestling where you feel there's a no-win situation. Listen, if he doesn't divorce her publicly, he still, then, I mean, he sends her away quietly. Then what about his family? What about his name? What about what? What about? And why would God let this happen? God, I've been faithful to you. I've tried to love you. I've tried to serve you. Why why did you allow this to happen? Why her? Why them? Why, Why am I in this? I didn't want this. There's some of you here today, and that exactly describes the situation you're in. You're in a situation you didn't choose. You're in a situation you, did not, you don't totally understand. You're asking yourself, how did, why, what, what am I going to do? And when you look at it, you feel like there is a no-win situation and decision in front of you. And the Christmas story says, even in the midst of those kind of questions and those kind of feelings, God is working in ways you can't begin to understand. He's at work. Take comfort. God is at work even if you can't understand him. And his silence is not a sign of his absence. Joseph's got to be asking a bazillion questions. And as he's considering this, as he's thinking about it, he doesn't know what to do, and we don't know how long it was between the time Mary told him and the time God spoke to him through the angel. But it was enough time that there was a great deal of turmoil. It's very, very interesting. I mean, look at it in verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold... In other words, it's like he's in the middle of this turmoil, and all of a sudden, it's like, can you believe this? Whenever you see the word behold, it's like, stop, time out. Wow! Can you believe this? Get a load of this. I mean, here here he is. He's struggling, and now all of a sudden, there's an angel appears to him. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Do not fear. Do not be afraid of the, of the honor of your family. Do not be afraid of your own honor. Do not be afraid of what's going to happen in the synagogue. Do not be afraid of what are people going to say in the community. Do not be afraid of your own financial future and who's going to hire you and how are you going to support her. Do not be afraid of those things. The things you worried about, don't worry, I've got those things, is what God is saying. I've got this. Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph, straight up, she's told you the truth. She's as good and godly as you thought she was. She is an awesome person because She'll bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people. What is Jesus' name? What does the name Jesus mean? Savior, deliverer. 
Joshua in the Old Testament is the Old Testament version of it. He, he's going to be the Savior. You're going to call him Savior. You're going to call him Deliverer because he's going to save people from their sins. And look at it. For he, and it's, it's different in the original, it's he himself. It's he and only he would be a way you'd understand that. He and only he. No one else. There's no other name. There's no other person. There's no other way. Only he can do it. And so God is declaring to him the future of this adopted son, Jesus. I mean, God is working all around us, even if you can't see it. So it's Christmas truth. He's whispering, he's talking, and he's working. Even when you can't see it, you can't understand it. And maybe today, you're like, I don't get what's happening. Can I just say to you, God is at work? And that leads us to the third thing, so powerful. God wants to be with us. God wants to be with us. Look at it in verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. So again, God speaking. Behold, in other words, can you believe it? The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Such a cool verse quoted from Isaiah chapter 7. We won't take time to look at Isaiah chapter 7, but let me just kind of summarize it for you this way. That promise is given during a very, very dark time in the land. They're being invaded by cruel, um, cruel nations who will deport them, who will make them slaves. They've already been invaded by neighboring nations that killed 100,000 people and and deported 200,000. I mean, it's a dark, dark time. And, And then on top of that, there's a king who's wicked and godless. And how godless is he? He's burning his kids in the fire. And he wants nothing to do with God. And God says to the prophet Isaiah, I want you to go to this wicked king Ahaz, and I want you to give him a promise. Tell him there's going to be a child that's going to come named Emmanuel, God with us. Tell Ahaz, I want to be with him. Are you kidding me? I mean, I think we all can can get the idea that God wants to, we have a tendency, humanly speaking, If we don't understand the Bible and we don't understand God, we have a tendency to think God wants to be with good people. God wants to be with godly people. God wants to be with people who pray, who read their Bible, who God wants to be. Those are the people God wants to be with. And it's true, he does. But he also wants to be with people like Ahaz. It's not just the good and the godly God wants to be with. God wants to be with people, period. He wants relationship with people. He comes, I mean, he comes to this man who who has done heinous things. I mean, it can't get much worse than sacrificing your child in the fire, hearing the screams. You know where they would do it? They'd do it right outside of, of Jerusalem, right outside the city of walls, the Valley of Hinnom. It was also called the Valley of Topeth, the Valley of the Drums. And they would have people drumming to drown out the cry of the infants being burned in the fire so people in the city walls wouldn't have to hear it. Are you serious? God, you want to be near that kind of person? You want to be with that kind of person? You'll reach out to that kind of person? And the answer is, not only does God reach out, God initiates the reaching out. And in that whole story, we get get echoes. We get get a foretaste of what we've been learning in Romans, that 
while we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. God reaching out to us. Why? So God might be with us. And so because there was no way for us to be with him unless our sin was dealt with, Jesus Christ came to die. This child came that he might grow up, might live a righteous life, might die for our sin. Why? That God might be with us when we put our faith in him. How much is he with us? How close does he get to us? Well, when you give your heart to Christ, he lives in us. Can't get much closer than that. But as we're going to see in Romans chapter 5, it's not only him living in us, but it's us living in him, us clothed in him, us wrapped in him. So he's on the inside. He's on the outside. This God who in the beginning walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, this God who delights in being close to people, makes it possible through the sending of a son, Jesus, who saves people from their sin. And his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. And if you want to know what heaven's like, then you get down to Revelation chapter 21. And it says, now is God near men and he will be with them. What's heaven like? We're with God, undistracted, undiminished, the God who loves us so much that he planned in eternity past to speak close to us for eternity future. Amazing. God with us. God with us. Joseph, take Mary because I'm sending a savior and you'll call his name Jesus because he will save. And forever he'll also be known as Emmanuel, God with us. And that's what Christmas is all about.